You're listening to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, episode 28. Rob White here is an award-winning filmmaker, artist, ecologist, storyteller, and entrepreneur whose work celebrates life and explores the connections between people and the earth. His films have won multiple awards at international festivals, enjoyed theatrical release in the US, and have been broadcast worldwide. He is the CEO and co-founder of Mammals, the first interactive live streaming platform dedicated to nature storytelling, presenter-led shows, and IRL experiences. Rob founded Mammals to bring new voices into the natural history conversation, diversify perspectives across the globe, give creators economic opportunity, and use modern technology to provide real-time impact for the issues that surround the natural world. His work in film explores the crossroads between art, nature, love, and our spiritual connection to the earth. He recently completed a feature-length art film, the first in its series of what he calls post-documentary films, entitled The Ecology of Jazz. This black-and-white film embraces slow cinema and breathes new life into the simple pleasure of deep listening while poetically exploring the art of nature and the nature of art. Prior to this, Rob directed the feature documentary True Wolf in 2012, world premiering at the Seattle International Film Festival, and picked up for theatrical distribution by Shadow Distribution. True Wolf is an intimate story about a young Montana couple who gave up everything for the love of an abandoned wolf pup named Kowani. Rob also directed the multiple award-winning feature documentary The Little Red Truck, which enjoyed a US theatrical release in the top 50 major markets in 2008 and was subsequently released on DVD worldwide, including Netflix and Blockbuster. In 2006, he made the wildlife film Hollywood Fox for Parthenon Entertainment, National Geographic International, NDR, Animal Planet US, and Voom TV, a unique blue-chip high-definition special about the endangered San Joaquin kit fox in California. Over the years, he has produced and directed award-winning music videos and shorts, including award-winning Right Now Living With Mountain Lions in 2013. In between his directorial efforts, Rob lends his skills to projects that he believes in. He served as writer, editor, and co-producer on two films, Battle of the Booming Grounds in 2016 and the film It's a Wild Life in 2014, which resulted in both films being selected to multiple film festivals with Battle of the Booming Grounds winning Best Nature Film at the 2016 Life Sciences Film Festival in Prague. As cinematographer, his work has been used in productions for Nat Geo, Discovery, Animal Planet, PBS, and international broadcasters, as well as many feature documentaries. He was also an on-camera host for a television series for the PBS about wildlife films in 1999. Rob is the founder and chief instigator of Wild Propaganda, a lifestyle brand and worldwide campaign to use art and clothing to call attention to the massive impact humans are having on Earth's wildlife species. Drawing on cues from vintage propaganda, film, pop art, fine art, and his intensive studies of the natural world, he creates striking colorful images that juxtapose animals and graphics that manifest multiple meanings and emotions, and ultimately question our relationship to the natural world, its wild creatures and wild spaces. His fine art paintings are inspired by his fascination with all things wild and his attraction to those elements of the natural world that aren't always readily visible. His intention to capture the spirit of each animal as he sees it and in turn leave a soulful piece of art to the world. He cites his influences as Jacques Cousteau, Orson Welles, Mary Oliver, John Wayne, Black Elk, Jackson Pollock, Maya Angelou and any and all types of music. Originally from Los Angeles, he lived in the northern Rocky Mountains in Missoula, Montana for 20 years with his wife Pam Voth and their two dogs before moving to San Diego to found mammals. Hi Rob, thanks so much for taking the time out to be on the show this morning. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks Jake for having me. I'm really excited about it. I love the show. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm glad you've been listening. I know you know a lot of the people that we've had as guests in the past. 
I sure do, yes, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, as you obviously know, this is all about inspiring, aspiring filmmakers. And I find the best way to do that is really to start right at the beginning and learn about your story and your your kind of transition into the wildlife filmmaking world. So can you just start us there? Tell us what it was that got you into wildlife filmmaking. Sure, yeah. So I had a dream uh, when I got out of the Navy. I was on a nuclear-powered submarine, um, and which was total other story. <laughs> uh, but when I got out, I, uh, I had this uh, idea that I wanted to write books and, um, and I decided that I was going to be a wildlife biologist. So um, I went up to, um, I was living in Southern California, went up to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, um, and I started getting a degree in wildlife biology. And um, I did work with the California Condor Program, and um, the gist of the whole thing was I discovered that this, there's this strange thing that happens with us and this, I'm, we call it the human drama. And wildlife just does its thing. And you're a biologist and you want to study wildlife. But to me, what I discovered immediately was this drama going on surrounding the condor was actually hindering conservation. And like it, it, was, it was people and all these different factions that had this idea of how to save the condor. And then the egos going into that of the people wanting credit for it and who was going to do this. And then the different belief systems from the, the you know, the native, uh, the native uh, tribes to uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to the nonprofit organizations. They all had a different idea about this. Um, in the meantime, they're spending $20 million captively propagating the condor to bring it back from the, you know, 20 something birds that were left in it, no birds in the wild. And they were spending all this money on getting the population back up in captivity to begin to put them out in the wild. And they spent zero money on telling the public about what was going on. So we released the first birds and they run into the exact same problems. Antifreeze in the back of gas stations, you know, they were hitting power lines, people taking pot shots at them, lead, huge factor, you know. Um, and so, um, and it was just crazy. So we had to bring them all back in. And, um, and I had just off the cuff said, well, how come we're not spending any money on PR. Why aren't we telling people? And um, like, wait, we don't have any money to do that. And it just blew my mind. And so it's like, well, we should make a little public service announcement and distribute that out. Well, that ended up <laughs> parlaying into this 20 year journey that I've been, I've been on, 20 plus year journey I've been on now. Um, I they looked at me when I when I mentioned let's make this PSA piece and said, well, when do you start? At the time, I was just this lowly, you know, nobody in this organization, and um, and I had no experience with you know cameras or anything like that. I literally wanted to be a biologist writing books, and um, and so I, I first I said, well, I don't I don't I don't have any experience, and then it's like, well, you're the only one that's expendable here, basically. So <laughs> like. Go do it. I went and I borrowed a camera from the media department at Cal Poly. And I started on this, you know, path. I, I literally was, uh, <laughs> I was uh, reading the manual of how to operate the camera while condors were flying right over my head. Right. And, you know, just, just trial by fire. Um, and the thing that happened over that period of, as I began to make this PSA piece, was I started interviewing people and I fell in love with this form of storytelling that was just so rich in that it was visual, but it gave me the same uh, deep down 
connection, you know, to stories that I felt with writing and um, and just a almost a much more dynamic way of telling it. And what was supposed to be a 30 second uh, public service announcement turned into a 60 minute documentary. Wow. And um, I basically did everything myself um, from shooting to uh, to writing to uh, editing. I learned all of it on the fly and I composed the music. Um, and um, and with a friend, I played the music on it too. And so it was basically just uh, quite quite funny when it was done and the credits were there and I was like <laughs> learning how to put credits on it. It was basically right. like me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I had no idea what to do with that other than I. what I also did was, was made sure that it was cut in such a way that could be used for educational purposes by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so that was my main goal with it. But then I thought, well, what do you do with a wildlife film? I don't know. I, I, I knew, you know, I'd grown up watching, you know, uh, Mutual of Omaha, and I was like such an enormous fan of Jacques Cousteau growing up. Uh, and then, of course, Marty Stouffer and Wild America and all this stuff that we had, you know, we, you know watched as, as young kids. But I had no idea what to do with it. So um, I uh, went on the internet, of course, the early stages of that. We were still with like the 14 four modems where you actually heard right. heard the internet, heard it connecting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I looked up, what do you do with a wildlife film? And the first thing that came up was the International Wildlife Film Festival in Missoula, Montana. And I had no idea there was even a thing as a wildlife film festival. So um, I looked at it and lo and behold, the day after, um, the next day was the deadline for entering a film. And so I just piped it off and I said, I can't, I can't make the deadline, but here's what I did. And I've just like laid out this long, really overdramatic email about here I am. I was so green behind the ears. I didn't know what I was doing. And they, and, um, so they just piped back really friendly and said, no problem, just send it up. Totally no no problem. And so I sent it up, paid my entry fee, and promptly forgot about it. Went back to, you know, trying to be a wildlife biologist. Um, and three months later, randomly, I got um, a voicemail that um, was multiple voicemails in a row that told me that I had won multiple awards wow. and invited me up to Missoula, Montana. And that was the start of this journey that I've been on, you know, as a wildlife filmmaker. Um, I, I told myself that, um, that the day somebody tells me don't quit your day job would be the day that I would probably, you know, reconsider right. what I was doing. And of course, that's never happened, which is great. Right. Um, and I've and so I've been able to do this um, in one way or another, you know, keeping the, the fire lit and creativity going. And um, I feel like I have a, a PhD in, um, in uh, business now more than anything. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, at that first film festival, I met so many people and was so inspired. And um, I, I really think from, from my perspective, for me, and, um, and I, I think this is, is the case with a lot of people since then that I've known, that having that calling card of having completed something myself and taken it from this concept into you know, pre-production. Of course, at the time, I didn't know pre-production and post-production. I didn't know any of that, but I, this is what I had done. And I learned it all on the fly. And I presented that, I won awards for it. And I had a lot of people who all of a sudden took notice that, well, and, wow, and, you... And that's huge. I mean, to, to, to do all of those things yourself. I mean, I know that because I'm a filmmaker, you know, doing everything. Yep. I don't compose the music though, so so um, I, I can only imagine. But I mean, just picking music 
from a from a, a, a you know a stock library to 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 find yeah. the right nuances and to to fit with your film is extremely hard and i tell people yeah. you know you've got to put days into that just to find what you need to fit um but to do all of those things is incredible and to be able to win awards on your first attempt as well is fantastic and must be hugely inspiring for you to keep going which is great you found your tribe I totally that was the other thing too that I was really just it was such a a wonderful thing to walk into this room full of people who were so inspired and inspiring and so friendly and willing to help willing to talk to me willing to mentor me um I think one of the things for me that really helped early on is that I actively sought out mentors, um, yes. people who I could call on, people who I could, you know, be inspired by and, you know, find out how do you do these things. And that's um, huge because yeah. one of one of the answers I give people all the time when they say to me, you know, what what's the best way to get into wildlife filmmaking? What should I do? Um, the first thing I say is, look, it's going to cost you money, but go to the festivals. Because yeah. especially if you've already been filming and you have something, go because you're going to meet people. You know, it's not, we're all nervous when we go for the first time. We, you know, it's like, you know, how do you walk up to people and start speaking to them? But once you realize how everybody is part of a big family, we're all passionate about the same things. And no one really has a big head. It's There's no egos. You know, you check your ego at the door and everyone's just in it for the same reason. And um, yeah. I think that's hugely inspiring. And when people see that, it's hard then not to keep going back to the festivals over and over because you want to go back and see your friends and your peers. And, and, um, and as you say, everyone's willing to offer you advice no matter where you are, which is so valuable. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, that's that above the friendships over the years, uh, and just the the uh, camaraderie, um, just drawing inspiration from seeing the creativity and the tenacity that everybody has to you know and the inspiration on uh, on solving conservation issues and communicating about things that matter to us. All of that is something that's just that food to you know keep me moving yeah. all all the time uh, just it's uh it's a wonderful thing to get into for sure um so well, but it's also go go ahead oh good sorry go ahead i i, I, I was just going to say it's also a it's also it's also something though that's um you kind of need that because it's a very difficult thing to do it's very it's not an easy business to be in there's a yes. lot of twists and turns and and uh thinking on your feet and um, it's not just about um you know creating a film i like to say what used to be when i started in the business that you know making the film was three quarters of the job and then a quarter of it was getting it out because there were all of these options for you to get distribution um or get co-productions or outright commissions or whatever it may be. And over my career, that ratio has completely flipped. It's a quarter of the job now yeah. is actually making the film, doing the creative work, and there's three quarters of it getting it out and trying to make an impact with it. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's the thing. When you start out, you, you are so focused on the making, the creating, because we're creators by heart. And that that's... You know the hard part i was speaking uh, last episode with rob uh, rob nelson and we were talking about you know the entrepreneur that we have to be i think i called him an entrepreneur he didn't call himself one but i, I feel like we're all <laughs> entrepreneurs at the same time as being filmmakers because you have to be you know if yeah. you're taking on that role of doing everything then you've got to fund it and you've got to get you know find somewhere to put it and and that is the hard part that's the bit we don't think about you know, we, we work on creating. And then once we've created, we're like, oh, so what do I do with this now? <laughs> How do people see this? What, it's for free? <laughs> yeah, that's the hard part. I know I, I made a, a kid's book, a little board book, um, and I pr had it printed in China. And I mean, it's a professionally look, you know, professional book. Um, but once I had it done, the work started. 
and people yeah. say to me how did you do that you know oh it's incredible what was it really hard doing it? i said you know two to three percent of the work was writing and putting that book together the other 97 to 98 percent is marketing <laughs> it because otherwise it sits in my garage <laughs> and no one knows it's there so it's all irrelevant you know so and it's kind of similar yeah. with films but so so tell us rob when you um so you you won the awards and at that point you were like wow i can do this what was your next move? Because I think so many people get to the, not necessarily winning awards, but they make a film, they go and they put it in a festival and it might be an official selection or, you know, it might not get in, it might win awards, but it, it's kind of irrelevant really, because even if you win awards, it doesn't mean there's anything that happens after that, right? You can get that little laurel and you're like, wow, I'm a professional filmmaker, but then yeah. nothing happens. So what uh, did you do next? Yeah, I have seen that's it's it. it I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think throughout my career I've seen that, and most of the time with most of the filmmakers who've come come and gone, you know, yeah. in the, the industry, the people you meet at film festivals for the first time, they win awards and and it just there's there's not a lot of um, of opportunity without creating it yourself, right? Um, and so. Um, yeah, it's a little bit heartbreaking to see all those voices and you know perspectives that sort of get get uh, swept away just because the business side of this is is a difficult thing to do. Um, yeah, so um, I, I I think the thing that I I started realizing so there there, there are two things that happened on the very first festival I went to one was I had, I met a person named Albert Carvinen. And Albert was a prolific uh, wildlife filmmaker, Carvinen, uh, Carvinen Productions, Carvinen Films up in um, Toronto. And he made so many films. I mean, it, he was just one of these people that you didn't necessarily, unless you're in Canada, you didn't necessarily hear of him, but his films were beautiful and he had he was bringing up this this crew of people who sort of took over for him and, and went on and continued making films but Albert took me aside at the festival and he said don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do this I watched your film and you can do this and you just keep it up there are ways a, a hundred different ways to do this and however you choose to do it just you always have somebody you can call on and I, I don't know there was something about that that just struck me so deeply like these people really care and they're willing to help so I'm not doing this alone and I think a lot of times when you come to a festival and you're new and you throw yourself out there and, and you really do throw yourself out there I mean it's a there's something so deeply um, soulful and spiritual about the cr creative process, you know, that you throw out there and you're like bearing your soul to people. This is what I just made. It's this is my baby here and I'm putting it out there and all these people are judging you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you go, should I have just done that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's easy to fall into that trap of, us versus them, me versus them, you know, oh, those are the commissioners, those are the business people, you know, I don't want to deal with them. But um, they're in the same boat as everybody else, you know, they believe in things and they want people to believe just like everybody else does. Um, so I think having those people that you can and seeking them that trust you and, and, and believe in you um, is something that was for me, I think all along has been um, something that I actively seek even today. You know, I don't ever want to stop learning. I think that's another important thing. Um, and I think if people know that, you know, I don't know everything. I certainly didn't then and I certainly don't now. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are way better cinematographers, way better storytellers, and I just want to keep learning from them. So I've had that attitude all along. So the mentorship thing was one of the things that really was, I'm going to use this to my advantage. 
the other thing that happened in that very first festival was I heard the very first time that the pessimism from a commissioner talking to somebody who wanted to break in and didn't understand the business. And they said, well, you need to have a $100,000 rig. And then if you get that, then we may give you a part of a sequence that may or may not be in the film and it most likely won't be paid. Wow. <laughs> and I looked at that and, and that was the idea of working for um, a, a broadcaster. Yeah. And it stunned me, it floored me. And I looked at it and I said, well, I made my first film on my own and maybe my path here is to be an independent and maybe not go work for the broadcasters. Maybe I've got the wherewithal to do this myself. And if I can put together this network of people that um, can help me over time, then I can make this work. And, and that's what I did. Um, Fantastic. So, and so you, you, yes, by, by reaching out to the right people and having those people on board or being able to reach out to them whenever you, you needed to helped. Mm -hmm. and, and we should say here that what I, I think what's so nice now is that has flipped quite a bit. The, the whole, you know, you've got to have a hundred thousand dollar rig. You've got to do that. The nice thing is, I mean, I remember those days too. You know, when, yeah. when I was hosting, we were on an F 900, an $80,000 body <laughs> with a 20, $25,000 lens. And, and that was yeah. kind of expected. But, and when, you know, if you listen to um, Rick Rosen, Rosenthal's interview and, uh, oh gosh, um, oh, a few of them, they're, they're all talking about yeah. how, you know, they mortgage their houses to spend 150 <laughs> grand on a film camera. And, yeah. and those days are gone because now a great example is Patrick Dykstra, who's on the, the show, who used a, um, a, a DSLR and a phantom drone, got some footage of behavior of whales and it ended up being in uh, Blue Planet. And that's yeah. because researchers are looking online now and they're finding this stuff and they're going, how, how can we get this? Do you want to be involved? Can we license it? Can you come and help us film it? You get involved in a different way and um, typically it's not for free which is uh, which is good so so i should say that because we don't want to put people off you know oh, used definitely to be extremely not. hard and and, and things it, it's still it's still not easy but it's certainly there are there are other ways in now yes a hundred percent which um of course we can we can we can get to what i'm doing now sure. but in 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 a huge part that's the reason that yes. we're doing what we're doing now is because the opportunity is there yes. to and do things let's, with we're, something we're, as easy as a smartphone. Yeah, and we're going to get to that because I know I want to I want to yeah. talk to you a lot about what you're doing now, but I just want to yeah. finish off kind of how you got there so we don't sure. confuse you'll confuse me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let alone the listeners. So what we'll do I, I want to I want to talk about where you what you ended up doing and going through and you can get me to this Hollywood Fox because yeah. I, I sat and watched Hollywood Fox last night with my kids and I have questions <laughs> from my kids to you for oh, awesome. <laughs> they, they, they want some questions answered so so <laughs> so you you met the Canadian filmmaker and so yeah. what what kind of where was your next step what was the the glue that really cemented you earning a living let's say you know wh when did you start getting paid for doing this um, I started uh, shooting for uh, for different productions. Um, so the the immediacy of it, as I as I wanted to uh, still make my own films, was that I um, I started uh, shooting for other productions. Um, so I was able to uh, just get you know piecemeal work going and um, and that was a huge thing for me of course it was helping me cut my chops with you know learning cameras and and just um, and really um, I like to call myself uh, ca camera agnostic You're right because I, I you know it was uh, to me it was like 
um, I heard somebody at one point in time say, whatever camera, like when they were asked, what camera do you use? And said, well, whatever camera I need to use for the story. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to use that because that makes the most sense to me. Um, and that's what I've done. You know, I, I, I've owned cameras over the years, but, but that idea of, of whatever camera is good for that particular story, yeah. whether there's lots of money or whether there's no money, yeah. you know, it just depends. Um, so I was shooting, um, and then I made, um, I was, I, my idea was that I was going to make a, a series of, of, uh, films. And I started on this project called This Is Wild. And um, I knew that in the broadcast world, that was gonna be a difficult thing to do. So I was looking for um, benevolent money, you know, was it a grant, you know, or somebody, you know, some, you know, individual who, you know, wanted to support wildlife causes, you know, um, and, and help me communicate about them, could they help help with this and I did find um, I did find an individual who backed two pro projects in a row and I and I, I say this because the thing that happened with those projects is they weren't commercially successful but as you mentioned Hollywood Fox it this led into getting a an eight the first basically the first HD production that this big distributor had done. Um, and so one of those little films that I was going to make was about the San Joaquin Kit Fox. Um, and the other one was uh, about northern elephant seals on the San Simeon coast um, in, uh, in uh, California. And uh, so I spent um, about a year making those two films um and basically going back and forth between the coast and um, i was kind of doing it at the same time um you know shooting as i needed to uh and um and i ended up making these films and they didn't sell but they were calling cards right and that to me was more valuable than anything else yes um you know you could always look for that you know, short-term gain and, you know, the little like shot in your arm. It's like, yep, yeah. I did it and I got paid and that's cool. But in this case, it was, I, I, I knew that number one, the format was uh, a series of half hours and, you know, the way broadcast goes every six months they changed. We're yeah. looking for half hours. Oh, now we're looking yeah. for hours yeah. and, the, you know, it just was, it was ridiculous and it was hard to keep up with. So I made a series of, uh, you know, two of these half hour episodes and I was trying to pitch this as a half hour series, wasn't going anywhere, but, but that was the thing that got me more work as a cameraman. Yeah. And, and, and that's so important. And, and I, sorry, I don't want to cut you off in, in yeah. flow, but it's so important because, um, you know, it doesn't, it, it's probably like being an artist or being, you know, a creative in any way. If you have no back work, then how can you be taken seriously? You know, if you're right. going and you're saying, I want to do this, and they say, well, what have you done? It doesn't have to be the best thing ever, but the fact that you've been doing it for years or a few years, or you just have some work shows that you're serious. It shows yeah. that you are doing it. And I mean, I go back and look at some of my first stuff. It's so bad, <laughs> but it's there. And it just shows I had a camera yeah. and I was filming with it. And so yes. starting out, it doesn't really matter as long as it, you know, it's, it, it's your history in, in yeah. this you know, platform or arena, if you like. So sorry, yes, carry absolutely. On. Yeah, um, and you know, and that was uh, that was something at at the time that I I just because I had been talking to so many different people, um, there were opportunities you know that would come my way. It's like, hey, we're doing this production. Can you go out and shoot for this? And then, and for you know, after I had made those those uh those two films i spent um you know two or three years really just you know doing camera work mm -hmm. um and uh and that was huge for me um i think the other thing that that i wanted to mention too was something that that was important 
in the uh, in the evolution of of actually getting work as a cameraman is that I had edited. Right. And because I had edited, I knew about lead ins, lead outs. I knew about these things that you don't just get the footage and then you move the camera. You know, you let something walk in and out of frame and all these things that you you don't really understand until you see a cut piece. Building like, an oh. image sequence or telling a visual yes. story. Yeah. So yes, it's yes. Probably the and, most you know, important thing. Yeah. Absolutely. And and understanding that. Um, I think the idea that, you know, people people just want to know if they're going to hire you, they want to know that that's what you can do so they don't have to tell you this is, you know, you're getting paid to do this. Sure. You should already know this kind of stuff. And so that really helped me a lot. Um, and then I was going to film festivals, of course, um, and meeting more and more people because I was shooting footage and I had a great reel to show. Um, and at, at the time too, I was still pitching and, and writing up every time I came up with a concept, I would write up a two page pitch and I ended up having, you know, a hundred of these laying around. Um, and I'd go to film festivals and I would have maybe nine of them <laughs> and I, you know, I would, would have them all there and I would, depending on who the broadcaster yep. was i would pitch the appropriate program to them which which we should say is so so important because you you know you can't pitch the wrong show if they're not looking for that style of show that you're just wasting your time so you got exactly. to do your research on those networks yes and i learned i did learn that the hard way right um, <laughs> yeah but but it is a it's a very valuable lesson yeah. to learn yeah um but uh i you know so so Here's the thing that happened. And I, I love this story because um, to me, it just says a lot about perseverance and don't give up. So I pitched this, after I had finished this, this short Kit Fox film, I knew that there was this amazing story um, that was sitting there and it could 100% be broadcast. So. I came up with a creative way of telling the larger story, something that would be an hour film. And while I was making my living shooting footage for other people, I was pitching this um, and it kept getting turned down. And so I kept pitching other films and those were getting turned down too. And, and you know, it's still, I was, I was able to work. Four years went by. Went to Jackson Hole, was pitching a number of slew of other projects, and I got turned down on all of them. At the very end of the festival, one of the people came up to me and said, you know, do you still have that Kit Fox film? Have you done anything with that yet? And I said, no, but I could start tomorrow. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> He said, let's talk about that. And, and I, got a, I got a commission out of that. Timing, right? All yeah. about timing. What they were looking for. It felt they had, I'm sure, some idea that that was the kind of wildlife they wanted a show about. Or, it, it, you, know, they, they, you know, this happens all the time. I mean, my wife is a mountain lion biologist. We pitch m you know, numerous mountain lion shows. Most of them turned down. We've we've had been in talks for a year over one with a very big network got town, turned down at the last minute. Too many mountain lions, you know, too many mountain yeah. lions everywhere. Then, you know, a yeah. drought of mountain lions will go by for six or seven years and everyone wants mountain lions. So <laughs> it's just it's the way it goes, isn't it? And um, yeah. so so you I, OK, I've got to ask you some questions about Hollywood Fox. Now, first sure. of all, you so beautiful film. You, you told it in, and I, I would imagine when you were saying I had to work out a, a way of artistically telling that story, and that was probably to have uh, Fred and Ginger, the main characters, and very much like a Disney Disney kind of show, how they you follow two particular characters, in this case, two young Kit Foxes, and how they're going to adapt to their environment and all of the issues that come of being a young Kit Fox um, in Bakersfield. And, um, and so... 
let, let me just go into this. First of all, yeah. I, I had that, and I'm going to just do these in this order because that's the okay. way I've got them written down. Right? <laughs> so first of all, I wanted to know why you chose a British narrator. And the reason I'm yes. asking that is just because last time I was at a film festival, I was speaking with various networks about, you know, I've noticed a lot of British people. Obviously, I'm British, and I've noticed a lot of British people on American TV. When I was yeah. hosting early 2000s, we struggled to get our shows that were going to 147 countries on uh, National Geographic International, we were struggling to get them onto the American market because I was British. Yeah. And what they yeah. would do is take our show idea and remake it with an American person. And so it was fascinating to me, you know, what was the thought process there and was there one or was it just what happened? I love, love, love that you asked this question because this leads into something that I probably should have said also 90 percent of the work that i got in broadcast was through international means interesting not yep. not american money and we and i should just point out because a lot of listeners probably don't understand this but uh, and we'll use national geographic as, a, as an example national geographic international Hundred, it might be more than this now, but 147 countries at the time I was working with them, um, they do not transmit or broadcast to the U.S. market. The U.S. market is a satellite market of its own, right? It has yep. its own market, and the rest of the world is doing its own thing. So mm -hmm. there's literally no. Oh, there is some crossover, I'm sure, but typically they have separate scheduling and separate shows, and yes. that happens with other networks as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. I got commissioned from a company named Parthenon Entertainment. Uh -huh. um, Carl Hall was the head of Parthenon Entertainment. Um, and, um, and at the time they were, you know, one of the larger distributors of, of wildlife films. Um, had, uh, had output deals with uh, National Geographic International and, you know, basically you name it. Um, so I got commissioned from them to do a film that they had put together a co-production with a variety of, you know, territories, um, people, National Geographic, International, um, NDR in Germany, um, and, and a couple of others that got the film produced the American broadcast of that happened after the fact. And it was on Animal Planet. Interesting, um, yeah. Which was so interesting, too, because I had was always under the impression that if it was National Geographic, it, it would separate. never be on a Discovery property, uh -huh. and like it just wouldn't happen. Um, but in this particular case... Um, because the way the world was working right. at the time, you know, yeah. I had ended up being on both National Geographic and in the U.S. Uh, on Animal Planet. Yeah. Um, so the version that is public now is the international version. Right. OK. And we, I should say it has Bernard Hill, the actor, famous yes. British actor. I think he's in Lord of the Rings and various yes. other shows. He is the narrator. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That was actually a thrill to have him as the narrator. I was so excited for that. Um, uh, and I, I just felt like it added, I don't know, it, in some respects, it was kind of like it, it, that, that fabulous voice just added so much validity to the story. Right. Um, yeah. And, and it, it made it, uh, it made it, um, a little less Disney and a little more charming. Sure. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that, that's fantastic. So I'm going to go on to these other questions for you, but okay. while we're on Hollywood Fox. So my kids were wanted to know when you, you're, you're walking along with the camera, you're simulating a fox walking along, and then it goes down the burrow, and now we're in the burrow. Yes. And they turn to me and they go, Dad, how, how are they filming in the burrow? So I said, well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I'm going to ask the man who knows. Yes. So how did you get the burrowing shots? Infrared, so, I believe it was. Yes, it, it was. Um, so that's interesting, too, because th those shots now would be way easier right. with all the new Absolutely. technology. Because um, we should say this is 2005, 2006? 
2004 we were filming okay yep so uh released in 2005 and 6 yeah uh so um we uh we actually had a um so w i was working closely with the the biologists um the whole yep. biology team and uh we um had just asked them um would it be useful to you if you could know actually what was in the dens because we had no idea whether we'd be able to get the footage or not of the right. foxes in there based upon you know what the structure of the den and could could we weave around and snake around in there to yeah. actually you know see this or what else was in the den because they burrow in kind of a maze form and they have bolt holes and all sorts don't they? it's not just like <laughs> yes. a, a rabbit hole down exactly yep. exactly um very intricate network mm -hmm. underneath uh, right there um and so we devised this um you know small little sony cam uh on a tether with a uh, flex pipe over the cable and it was about 20 feet long wow and we basically just shoved that thing down <laughs> yeah so just there. like a, a, uh, a consumer handy cam with infrared yeah. on yep yep yeah, they're still one of the yeah. only cameras you can get with infrared built into them, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah, um, and and that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was remarkable that almost immediately we discovered some really interesting things. Like um, uh, we had discovered like black widows right. that were hanging out on the inside of the, the den opening that you couldn't see from... Uh, but if you stuck your hand in there, wow. you'd find out really fast. <laughs> That's right. Um, find out the but then um, the, the shocker was the very first thing we saw in a kit fox den was a burrowing owl. Right. Which is a big part of the story. A big character yes. in the story. Yep. Absolutely blew our minds. We're like, what is a burrowing owl doing here? And, and at the time when we put it down on one of the other um, exits, entrances, exits to the to the den there, a kit fox had popped out. And so we, on the very first try, discovered that foxes and burrowing owls are in the same den at, at the, the same, same time. time. That's fantastic. Now, th yeah. this is a great opportunity to, to talk about how stories change, because you obviously weren't expecting that. And now no. in the final show, the owl is a main character or, you know, a, a side character, but they play a big role. And so yeah. when you pitched that show, it was about the foxes, but now it's got another character involved. And this is a great yeah. example of how you rewrite a story, you know, in, in the production phase, because you suddenly realize, wow, this is a good element that's going to bring more life to the whole piece. Yes. Um, so I, this is another wonderful thing to, to touch on here because the entire story was rewritten right. we were going to tell the story of the two these two foxes that was the, always the idea that it was going to be you know sort of brother and sister fox and pitting them against one another we didn't know all the ins and outs of it but it was fairly loosely based story and a lot of it of course when you're making films that are highly dependent upon behavior end up depending upon what behavior you actually get right exactly um, yep. to, to write it in so in this particular case not only did we discover the burrowing owl and and were able to write the burrowing owl in as another character but the story itself we went to uh we found an urban den that was uh on the edge of a a shopping mall uh parking lot and in this embankment going up. And this was an old recognized den. And we went there because there was a new litter of pups that were there and we were like, oh, this is gonna be so perfect because there's traffic here. There's just all kinds of things that we're gonna be able to film here and humans around and like how these pup, uh, these foxes gonna survive. Um, and I think it might've been the second day we went to film there. I had already been and scouted and was re and ready. And then we brought in a sound recordist and my assistant camera. And we got there and I, we go up and, and drive up and, and it's like, okay, they're right here. And we look and 
there's nothing. There's no den. There's nothing anywhere. It was there was like some new flowers planted and all. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, something's wrong here. I don't understand. So I immediately called the biologist and I said, that den at the at the mall is like it's gone. And he of course was what right. are you talking about? What's this? No, it can't. It's not gone. It was like Brian, it's gone. It isn't there. There's newly planted flowers. And he's like, "Uh uh-oh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. He came out. And hence, that was the... Big part of the show. You know, huge part of the story that a... uh, The management at the mall had ordered the landscaping company to basically get rid of those foxes. Which are endangered, we should add. Which are endangered. So it was illegally... They were illegally... Well, they weren't even removed, were they? They were buried. They buried were buried alive, alive and yep. um, and they had put uh, uh, malicious. I yep. mean, they had put uh, uh, you know a lot of like sticks and things to prevent them from digging out yeah. of it. Yeah, terrible, um, terrible. Well, yeah, I, I should say with that because we we should get to your current thing because I know we we want to talk about sure. that. But <laughs> if anyone wants to see at the time of this going out, um, currently Hollywood Fox is on Amazon Prime. That's where I yep. saw it last night. And so if if you're yes. a Prime member. You actually get it as part of your subscription, but I'm sure you can rent it if not. So um, wonderful film. I I really took a shining to it because it's very close to what I do. I mean, my niche now, which was never really a thing that I, you know, how niches just develop, right? Um, Mine is kind of, you know, road crossings and animals in urban, uh, you know, human uh, uh, urban interface. Uh, I do a lot of black bears in urban areas. I do a lot of uh, recently reconnecting wild all about deer, migrations crossing uh, in interstate highways uh, and pronghorn yes. so so and this was very similar because they're on that urban wildlife interface as you say though i think there was a cinema a, a theater just in that mall right across the road yep. from them and lots of shots of them trying to cross the road so so i took a shining to that and it was it was fun to watch so um okay so that's hollywood fox okay we should move to what you're doing today i mean we could do probably three episodes with you rob because you've got you've got wild <laughs> propaganda which i'd love to spend more time on but i think we should move on to mammals, but very quickly, sure. Wild Propaganda, which I assume is wildpropaganda.com. Is yes. that right? Which yep. is wonderful artwork of yours, which is all about, uh, well, people should go to wildpropaganda.com. It's your artwork, and it's kind of the juxtaposition between humans and, uh, am I putting that right? Is that the right way to say it? You know, you, humans and yeah, wildlife. Absolutely. So um, just real quickly, Wild yeah. Propaganda was, so, so, I can bring all of this up to speed, which will lead right up okay, into yes, what we're yes. doing now. Yep. So uh, it, it, it didn't take me very long, you know, maybe a, a good uh, 10 years ago when I was seeing the, 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 the massive shift that was taking place in, in the broadcast world and, and taking place because, not because the programs were bad or anything like that. Wildlife film is wonderful and I adore it. It's that the business model wasn't keeping up with the times people's sure. viewing habits were shifting and yep. these things were happening. And all of a sudden, this business was shrinking. Opportunity was going away, even with master people who were, you know, ending up having to fund their own projects, you know, not yeah. actually getting commissions anymore and blew my mind. And I was looking at the time for other ways to do things. So one of the things that we did was we we ended up making two feature documentaries because there was a market in the new, you know, feature world yeah. um, to to get these programs out there. And so um, we we did that. But the other thing, because I had these numerous proposals there that I was sitting there going, the way this is working, these are never going to get right. done. Yep. So what could I do to take these and actually communicate about them? And that's how Wild Propaganda was born. I, I grew up with, you know, with art as, as, as one of my uh, big things that I, I, I just was learning all the time about, you know, creating art. And, um, and, uh, and that's something that I loved. Um, but also the idea of storytelling through art. And so... Um, and I and I love the you know kind of the old uh, vintage propaganda posters and things like that. Just that kind of style 
Um, and I thought, well, why couldn't I take a film, an entire film, and create a work of art that would get the crux of what that film would be about and create vintage wildlife propaganda posters. Is, is there some of them on the wall behind you? Is, yes, is that your, yes, Yeah, absolutely. yeah, I should mention, if you're watching this yeah. on you, if you're listening to it, then you can't see them. But if, on the, <laughs> if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, there are some on the wall behind Rob. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <Carry> um, <laughs> <laughs> Not good for uh, people listening. Sorry. You were <laughs> Not watching. <laughs> Um, I, it, you know, it, it was one of those things that, um, I think goes to the idea of, you know, I, I didn't get in this necessarily to just make films. I got in this to communicate about the issues that are really important and dear to me, um, and that I feel are important for the rest of the world to know. Um, and in this case, with wild propaganda, you know, it, it, I think the thing about it that, that was interesting and, and and good for me was that it it was an outlet that I could just be as direct yes as I needed to be yeah no one no one's having... pulling the strings other than you yep yeah absolutely and you could be it in some respects very graphic yep. and you know but I felt like it because it's in this sort of vintage propaganda way and it's art that it's much more digestible that there's a drop of blood somewhere or sure. you know you actually see an elephant that has its tusks cut off yeah. or you know a rhino with its horn cut off and that kind of thing um so it, i the other part of that was i wanted to create something that could maybe be infused in the sort of pop culture and have you know why not put a wild propaganda shirt on and wear that with a pair of jeans and walk around and you've got a conversation piece that you're wearing yes. now that you can actually tell people about when they ask about it. Well, that's and, fantastic. And they're, they're available to buy those t-shirts and yes. other swag, I think, on your wild sure. propaganda yeah. site. Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. I, I love that. And I love the way that you're always trying to think, because I'm the same, like at my entrepreneurial <laughs> side, I'm always trying to think of how can I interweave what I love and what I do, my passion, with other forms of media? Because, yeah. I mean, we, I think times are changing now. Broadcasters are going f way more down the conservation. I mean, only a few years ago, conservation was a dirty word in TV. And, and I, th I yes, think that's very, very fair to say that. If you were trying to push an issue, you just wouldn't get it pitched. And, yeah. you know, I think here it, we should be clear on, you know, a lot of, filmmakers who are starting out desperately trying to chase the money to get on a network show or do this what you have to understand is there are you know w when you do that you do have to give away some of your artistic expression right because yeah. the story can change you don't have necessarily complete control over it when you're right. taking money from someone else they are really calling the shots and so you mm -hmm. have to decide is that what you want do you want to be a filmmaker who's ready to do that or do you want to make a show that's, that you're ready to, to make and put out there? And then, yes, you have to find your own funding. And, and I think Dan O'Neill is doing that very well, who is on the show. You know, he's, he's looking for ways to bring money in so he can make the shows he wants to make. Um, yes. I, I, with my film recently, Reconnecting Wild, at the beginning, there's a deer hit. I don't think yes. many broadcasters would have let me put that in the show. We've had a, lo that's, a lot of backlash. That's true. Yeah, we've had a lot but of backlash from public who have seen it saying there should be a warning on it. You know, I feel differently because I don't feel it's very bloody or gory, but that yeah, is one of those I mean, things, you know. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to, I know one of the things that has always been a, a big problem with with connecting people and us making an impact is is sort of sugarcoating these things that right. happen out there. And we can't, we can't do, people need to know yeah. what's happening. And I think for too long, because we've had to make things, you know, digestible to the broadcast public, and that sort of bled off into this this um, you know world that's we're changing now. I mean, it is very much changing now that conservation is definitely something you can say, yes. and and you can you know it, there's still pushback in terms of the the, the broadcast world about about um, you know including things like that scene at the beginning. I thought it was a brilliant film, by the way. Thank I, you. I love your film. Thank you, I um, appreciate it. 
and it's it's impactful and i think that's what we need to start yeah. moving toward is things it's how do you make an impact yeah. Well, you don't, um, the way I see it is you don't change people's minds unless you do. And yes, you're going right. to put some people off. And I feel that probably with that show, the comments I've had back, maybe 10 to 15% are put off. And I'm like, yeah. that's fine because they don't believe it's necessary. But what I feel is they don't understand that if they're not the people I'm trying to change the minds of. It's the right. other people who need their minds changing. <laughs> if, they've already, if they're already on the right train of thought, then that's fine. Um, but yeah. but yeah, it's you know okay. But well, I think this is a great segue because yeah. it moves us into what you're doing now, and it moves into a perfect way of talking about why you did what you did with mammals and what mammals is all about. And I think it is it's all yeah. about giving people a voice, which is uh, really what we're talking about. So let's talk about mammals. And I should preface this with saying mammals is M A M M A L Z, and you yes, can go to mammals dot com, and there's an app. Tell us about mammals. Yeah. So mammals was born out of this notion that something had to change. We weren't making, I, I wasn't personally making enough impact. I was seeing a lot of my colleagues and, you know, who had way more uh, prolific experience than I, than I did with, you know, making films for broadcast and huge, huge productions just lamenting that while wow, the world is changing so fast and are, are we making any impact at all with what we're doing this is not wanting to change what we're doing but how do we make more impact and then we've been moving of course toward let's make more impact with the films that we have and hence this you know you create this this film and that's you know a small portion of the actual project there's right. so much about getting it out. And then once you get it out there, now let's add on, let's make an impact with it. And it's this long tail project that in many respects takes so long to make. And I mean, I, I know people who've been working 10 years on a project and now they're going to try and make an impact with it. And I think that's absolutely important to do. But Mammals was born out of there's so much more we can be doing that we're not. And so I knew that there was um, some other type of platform that we needed to make. And I had been talk thinking about this for a long, long time that I, I wasn't seeing anybody really do that. Anybody creating a platform that was what I was talking about. How can you... Um, have this set of, of changes made that actually include more people and make a bigger impact. So Mammals was designed to bring more voices to the table, to allow for different perspectives to be, um, to be out there, to be in the forefront. Um, not just the same voices telling the same stories over time, but what does somebody who lives in a certain place in the world have to say about that place rather than let's go send an American filmmaker over to tell that person's story. Mm -hmm. Technology's gotten to this place where you could take a smartphone out and tell a story now, and you could put that up on any number of channels and, and it's beautiful and you can make some type of an impact, except that it's very difficult to cut through all the noise on those places, which is why I believe wholeheartedly that having our own platform is the way to do this. So the other side of this is that the one area of that, that has emerged in media now that I find the most exciting and um, I, I was introduced to the business model behind it from my co-founder, Alex, who is a wildlife filmmaker, who was struggling to, to you know, get commissions and make it in the business, get work, just like everybody you know, is. And I had met him three years ago, and we, um, I told him about the, my idea that I wanted to create this new platform. What do you think about this? And of course, at first he thought I was crazy. 
And I was like, well, that's good because that means it's a, a pretty bold idea. Right. Um, and then he came back over time and he's like, you know what? I Have you ever thought about IRL live streaming like they do on Twitch? And the light bulb went off. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, because I, I, I'm not very good with this stuff, but Twitch yeah. is a, a gamer's platform, I believe. Yes. So it's like so Twitch live. is, and I, honestly, three years ago, I didn't know right, about Twitch. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, Twitch to me was this grand social, uh, accidental social experiment. People play video games. There's a passionate community of people all over the world, millions of people who love video games. They hypothesized that what if people could watch other people play video games and you could broadcast those live and people could maybe form community. Maybe they'd even want to support the people playing the video games if they were entertaining enough. And all of a sudden, Twitch is born and, you know, they have millions of people on this. Five years ago, it sold to Amazon for a billion dollars because Amazon saw the potential of what this could do. And so that's how it was born. But now there's this other part of live streaming. So, so basically, Twitch proved that live streaming in real time content is something that not only is, um, is something that people would really like to watch, but that there's this propensity for people to form community around those people who are live streaming. So the idea behind this is that rather than have a site-wide subscription where it's just a free-for-all, you can get anything that you want on here and just watch anything, that's not what viewers want. Viewers want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they'll subscribe directly to spend more money to do this, subscribing and tipping a content creator directly so that they can be part of that community that's much tighter knit than this larger community that's just the site-wide Twitch community. And they end up making friends with other people who like that person. And they find commonality in this virtual world. And I know it may sound strange, but it's the world we live in. Right, yeah. I started seeing this as nature people are just as passionate, if not more passionate, than gamers. And if you start to break that down into people who love wolves or people who love bears or lions or giraffes or elephants, people who love you know, to talk about climate or are passionate about let's solve climate issues, all these things have these sort of micro communities that fit into the larger nature community but you can start to see how this puzzle can fit together where if you use the same model and you begin to live stream from out in the field about things literally from something as, e as small as your smartphone that you can live stream on to our mammals platform people watch they comment real time in, in their chat to you. You, as the content creator, can be out there making films. You can look down at, at your chat. Somebody's just asked you a question. You can answer them. They're now part of it with you. Right, and yeah. And all of a sudden, you've created this real time community, this real time feeling of, I'm bringing these people along with me. and we actually have a chance to solve things. Those people who love this are able to um, support you by giving you a tip or a donation, or in the future, we're going to have direct subscriptions to, to people's channels. But the idea behind it is it creates a real time, um, it's a, it creates a real time conversation yes. that you can have and you're out there making content and, it, and, and telling and, stories. And it could be 
anyone doing this in terms of it could be a biologist filming their yes. their research and so you might be you know into what they did it might be that um, i know you've got a few on there because uh, yeah. you've got a few thousand members signed up now haven't you i, I don't yes. know exactly but i know it's in the thousands yep yeah we um we have so so um we did a really long robust beta test on this to really find out what content was really engaging and we sort of opened it up at the beginning to you could pretty much post anything you wanted to whether it's photos videos you know so just kind of like VR. a youtube platform yeah. where it was and just it was, there yeah and, and we were and we were really vetting out what we wanted people to tell us yeah not directly tell us but show us sure. how they would use this and what we found is that live streaming by far gave us the most engagement right. and was the clearly, clearly the most, um, like I looked at it and I was like, that's how we're going to make an impact. Interesting. People are really into this and they like the, the, you see it in the, in the, the live stream when somebody starts getting comments and like, you're, you're doing your spiel, right? You're telling your story and you're doing your thing. You're showing people something. Somebody's out looking for, hey, let's go herping. Let's go look for lizards. And they're finding lizards and they find one. And then they look down at their phone and there's like 15 questions. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, there's 15 questions. Like, oh, hey, you know, so-and-so and you acknowledge that person. Yep. They say hi back to you. Like all, and it just blows my mind that it works this way. But it, but it's something so powerful all of a sudden. So, that so I you think could it's... be, you could be a researcher. You could be a, f yeah. a wildlife filmmaker. You could be mm -hmm. just some a, a birder, um, ornithologist, yeah. someone going out spotting birds. You literally could be doing anything, and you build your own community based around what you love doing and, and what people love seeing you doing. Yes, absolutely. That's the whole gist of it. I, you know, it's, it's sort of a, um, it, I think focusing, the thing that we learned is that you can continue this and broaden this into all different um, interests. But the focus that we have is that it works if you live stream it. Very and, interesting. And so, yeah, and that's, and that's the gist of mammals. So, you know, we are, um, uh, completely focused on, on live streaming in real life live streaming we're working on sort of paralleling the um, the advancement in technology so I know that you know this the, the, the satellite arrays are are like it or not the satellite arrays are being launched into orbit right. and they will give global connectivity it's a phase now I think aren't they yeah, yeah. absolutely um, and and there's multiple companies that are doing this mm -hmm. um, and so we are working with putting backpacks on people's backs and giving them greater connectivity with bonded modem technology. Wow. Eventually we'll connect to satellites. Like a live view backpack? Like a live view backpack, yep. absolutely. Yep. yep. And, um, and we have this program that we're, we're going to be launching here called Adventure Streamers, imminently launching called Adventure Streamers, where you can apply to be a, an adventure streamer and the only requirements are that you know how to live stream and that you have some consistency of what you're going to do but the idea is like like you said you could be any number of disciplines that's fantastic you know, and, yeah and just go out and do this and show us the world in ways that we've never seen before i think there's a few things about this that make it to me you know sort of purpose driven and that is one is diversifying the voices that we hear from mm -hmm. um, yep. and hearing local perspectives and and the globe the, you know this sort of global connection to hearing other people's perspectives we can i think grow much more as people if we if we have that the second part of that is providing economic opportunity for content creators that's something that has always been a struggle like how do we how do you know you you have to think about that business side of it and i'm not saying that you don't have to hear because you do i think being a live streamer is also being an entrepreneur right. because you cultivate community you still have to you know work the magic and and 
and they're funding you basically. Um, so there's all that play in this and there's still the business side of it, but the opportunity opens up for people to actually make a living creating content you know, telling stories about the natural world. Well, and I think what's so fantastic, I think it's on the, the cutting edge of where we're at now with technology and social media. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that, you know, to be a wildlife filmmaker, there is still, like we were saying earlier, you know, you got to spend a hundred grand on a camera. We well, don't need to do that <laughs> now, but you still need to have a camera. And yes, yep. you know, we all talk about, well, use your phone, if use the camera you have. Well, at some point, yeah. you obviously, you know, you do need to get yeah. different gear and you buy a camera and then you do need a microphone and then you do need a support rig to hold it and then you do need you know more batteries and the nice thing yeah. with this is pretty much everyone now has a phone and it has a camera and yep. it can live stream because it's always connected and that's only going to get better and better and yes. then of course as you say you're not limiting it to scientists or to filmmakers or to you know it can be that you love insects in your backyard and you want to show what's in your backyard on a daily basis i think one of the keys here because none of that is a limiting factor i think the key right. is consistency with in terms yeah. of making money from it because i know with yeah. i'm terrible at social media <laughs> right? i don't mind admitting <laughs> that you know um it, just trying to be consistent with social media to me i it's not enough yet for me of a, as a business tool to be on it every day or every hour and i know for some yeah. people it works incredibly well obviously mm -hmm. and you know they, they they it's consistency is the key you can't build yeah. a community up and then not post anything for you know a week or two or three um yeah because they miss you it's it that's very 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 true um, I think there's a few things about that too. So um, the idea of consistency, if you're, if you're talking about like, one of the hardest parts for social media in general is that you have to cut through the noise. Right. The noise of all this other stuff going on too that's competing for, and the algorithms that are just like nightmarish that yep. you have to break through and somehow trick yep. to get people to see you. Yep. And, and then there's, of course, this idea that on, you know, Instagram or wherever it may be, do you have to be sensational? Do you have to, like, what do you, what has to happen in order for you to break through? Um, and I think that the idea with mammals is that we have, we've sort of done that work for you in cutting through the noise. It's nature already. Yes. So yep. you're here, here's your tribe. Right, and you can find your tribe on mammals, and it's a niche and with niches within it. Right? Yes, absolutely, yeah. or niche. absolutely, niche. and niche. yeah, and um, and and I think that that's where this this power comes. So, and taking that even a step further, is that this idea of not only do you have economic opportunity for yourself but the impact that you can create is um, to me immense. And, and it's, I've, I've, I, don't, I don't necessarily like the idea of like calling something a game changer, but, but it, if done right, it's, it's potentially a game changer because there's, there's a couple things that happen with filmmaking that we, we don't make the impact that we should make because of it. And, one of those is that we don't, people don't see it frequently enough. In the advertising world, reach and frequency are these two things that you have to have in order for people to buy something. Sure. Yep. They need to see something seven times before they even make a move on it. Yep. Do we have that here in the, the natural world? No, not in the nature media industry. You make a film, people might see it once. Yeah. And you need to somehow make an impact right then to get them to do it. And that's a hard proposition because there's all this other stuff going on. So in this sense, if you're live streaming and doing it consistently and you have a community, you've got people who are hearing the stories over and over and over again. They're hearing you. Yeah. And, and not and, only that, you're in a situation where you're not having your stories 
diluted or sugar coated or it's right. not like you pitch an idea here's this great cause you know uh, poaching elephants in i mean obviously that's been done but here's this great cause um and, they, and it gets turned down and turned down no one hears it yeah. because no one takes yeah. it up. well we're not looking for that this you're in control you put it out there you say hey yes. look at this incredible local story of say the the foxes san joaquin yeah. foxes you know th this is happening right here next to this theater complex or, yes. you know, it might be a butterfly. I know that um, locally we have at the university here, we have a, a researcher on butterflies and there are these pockets of endangered butterflies that no yeah. one's going to know about. They're a little blue butterfly that you would take no interest in, you know, if you just saw right. it. It's not big and incredible, or, but they're endangered. And you could go out and you could make a film about it, or not even a film, you could live stream it on your phone to your community and build it up. I mean, it's a fantastic idea. And I, we should just say, just to make it very clear for people, this is an app on all yeah. app, wherever you get your apps, whether it's ISO or Android. So, so right now it's not on Android. Oh, okay, we are, sorry. I mean, yep. and no, that's okay. It, it will be on Android very soon. We're working on it. Yep. Um, that's the other part of, uh, of the, uh, you know, doing whatever you can to do to make this. I, you know, switched uh, three years ago into being a tech entrepreneur and right. this is a little bit of a different world. Yeah. Um, and so Trial there's a lot fire, of different things. It? Yep. Like, it is, it feels very much like it is, but, uh, but it's incredibly rewarding. So we are concentrating mostly right now on the, the, the best form right now is on web. Okay. At, mammal, at mammals.com. And that's because um, in general, it's a better experience because you, um, you, you just have more ways of interacting yes. um, on it. Um, but we, we have an iOS app and the iOS app, you can directly from the iOS app, you can um, stream live stream. Um, from the mammals app right on your phone yep. um, and then um, you you can still use android phones um, either through third-party streaming apps which there's an abundance of third-party streaming apps um, that um, people can use um, or on the web version um, that's responsive on on the android phone but we will be having an android version of it soon well i think what's um, fantastic about this rob is that you you the platform is there and it's growing and you are working on the way so if it's something that your our listeners are interested in or passionate about they can do it. if they're on an apple phone they can get it as an app if they're <laughs> everyone's on the web so you know on a browser we can log into it and use it on a browser so it's just a case of signing up and all of the yeah. other features are going to be coming. I know when I signed up a while back, a lot has changed. I know when I first signed up, you couldn't even get the app. You had to get right. it through a beta <laughs> tester app, right? Yep. And you had to download yeah. the beta tester and it came through as a beta. And now, of course, I have the app itself. Um, and you mm -hmm. can, and you don't have to live stream. I know that's the point, but you can still use it like a platform, say like YouTube, and you can go on and see other sure. people's. And of course, all of the live streams are recorded. They're all there. So you can go back into someone's stream and see all of those videos, a bit like yeah. the podcast here. So, yes. Yep. Um, and yeah, and you know, and as we move along, it's just, I mean, the idea behind this is to, to give give tools to creators to be able to tell more stories about the natural world. We believe that live live streaming will provide the greatest opportunity for them and the greatest impact um, for them. But that doesn't preclude them from being a filmmaker and making films. We invite that. We want that. We want people to be doing that. It's really important for us to be communicating in any way that we possibly can. I look at this as live streaming is a tool whether it's your full-time job doing it or whether it's this tool in your arsenal that helps you get your message out and like this is one of those things that you look at people always loved the um making of yes the making of always came that. at yep. the end behind the scenes yes yep. behind the scenes but think about this with live streaming now the fact that you can do this on your phone yes. also, yeah. 
you could be out there making a film and doing the entire making of right there while right. you're doing it yep. and bringing all those people an embedded audience with you that will have this feeling of connection and ownership in this project yep. that they've supported and like they're watching and they can't wait for it to be done and this feeling this feeling of pride at the end that they've been part of this journey with you that you created this work of art and they saw it while you were doing it live and that's not saying that you have to be doing that consistent you know like uh 24 hours a day but if you did it you know three times a week yep. you know while you were out making a film like there's a it's a beautiful way to use this new media this new platform this new technology to continue getting your message out and i think it just is a it's a powerful way to um to continue making an impact i, I think it's it's brilliant i mean that that's a way i could see of using it for sure um i yeah. say we would all find it find a different way to use it but certainly by doing a behind the scenes i run a mentoring group and i i do live office hours once a week to my group and it's just another kind of tool to be able to show behind the scenes and say, okay, this is the camera. I mean, we were talking earlier about the camera that works yeah. for the job. I do a lot yeah. of night filming now. I use a lot of, um, I have two uh, A7Ss because of their sensitivity and low light. Fantastic cameras, but I don't film with that in the daytime, you know? So it's kind of, right. you can show all those little, little nuances of what you're doing behind the scenes and giving it live. Absolutely. That's a great idea. Um, so there was a guy, can I get- Absolutely, just, yeah. There's like, there was this, there was a, there's a guy who, who uh, is a birder. He used to go to the film festivals, ran into the same problems that people always ran into with, well, you know, you have to have this expensive equipment or, you know, it's just like any film that he pitched, he just didn't have the experience. He didn't have the, they didn't want the story. It wasn't for them. All the roadblocks that are typical. This guy said he was also a gamer and he said you know i'm gonna figure this out i'm gonna take a i'm gonna take a backpack i'm gonna use this live view and i'm gonna go out with two cameras i'm gonna go out with my um dslr with a long lens i'm gonna go out the small camera that i can wear on my shoulder or i can you know use it with a, a handheld gimbal and and um and so he he did this and he like takes people out on these journeys with him and you're out there with him he's got it on his shoulder you're hiking with him and he's going birding and so you're walking there with him he's got an ipad that's that's there so he can see the chat people talk to him and he goes looking for birds. He hears a bird, he spots it in his scope. Then he sets his uh, tripod up. And then he switches on the iPad to show us the close-up of the bird. Right. And all of a sudden, people are like, oh my God, this is amazing. I love watching this. Yeah. And, he's, and he makes a living doing it. Yeah, it's incredible. Like he's, yeah, yeah it, it's just insane. And you're giving, so, you've basically created the tool for everyone to be able to do that from their phone. Yeah. Yeah, yep. that's incredible. So, um, Rob, we, we, we should leave it there. And we, we, you know, we should yeah. come back and do another podcast sometime. I said this with <laughs> Doug Allen. We had so much to talk about that we literally could make two or three episodes. Um, I would love because that. Because there's yeah. just so much to touch upon. And um, it's all such valuable information. It really is. It's been an absolute pleasure having you uh, on the show today. And um, thank you so much. Yeah, until next time. Thank you so much, Jake. This was wonderful. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please leave a rating and a comment. And remember to subscribe to keep up to date with the series' future episodes. You can find out more information about wildlife filming at jakewillers.com. And if you're interested in starting a career in the wildlife filmmaking industry or being mentored to further your career, then please visit jakewillers.com forward slash mentorship. Thanks for listening.